This took place over Christmas break of my sophomore year, so I was 15 and I'm 19 now. I was with my friends John, Mark and Emily and we were hanging out at Mark's house and decided to eat at Christmas down the street. It was walking distance but none of us drove yet anyway and by the time that we made our way back it was getting pretty dark. His house faces the water, but there's also a street in between it, so there was a boat or dockyard in front of the house. It was a really nice neighborhood, but it wasn't gated or anything, so anyone could roam in and around anywhere just about. I remember feeling, though, like we were being watched or something and heard some noises in the bushes, so I mentioned it to Emily and she said that she felt creeped out too. But I forgot about it by the time that we got back and we just got to it. The house was huge and it had three stories and we entered through the garage by using a number code and made the mistake of leaving the garage door open. But the house had an alarm system that would beep twice when you walk through the door which is important for later. We hung out downstairs in the game room and played with his new puppy for a bit. I remember the puppy wasn't potty trained yet so she had to stay downstairs in a gated area and we went upstairs to the third floor to watch a movie and not long after we heard the two beeps of someone opening the door. His family wasn't supposed to be home for another few hours and the pup started going crazy barking and we then heard footsteps. At this point, we were all pretty scared and honestly, the boys weren't any braver than me and Emily. Whoever it was started walking up the second floor and then we heard a man mutter, Where are you little bitches? We yelled that we were calling the cops and bolted to a random little room. It was a closet behind the bathroom and we just locked ourselves in there. And honestly, I've never been so scared in my life. I think John was the one who called 911 and I guess the guy got spooked because by the time they got there, he was nowhere to be found. But the door that enters to the house through the garage was left open. I remember going home that night and just bawling. It made me super paranoid about leaving doors unlocked and I have no idea what his intentions were but clearly they weren't good. Also, the pup wasn't harmed, thank god, and the parents thought that we were overreacting when they came home. This was after the police arrived and they didn't take us too seriously so I never really liked them after that but we got home safe and I guess that's all that really matters in the end. The mountain in front of the house was always inviting and I have a story to tell about it but first here are some interesting facts. I checked with my mum today and started discussing the land my family owned. Apparently while the land is now split among the family there are acres and acres. However one of these lands was a large section of the mountain. Yes my family owned a mountain. This immediately triggered a series of questions that, while I would have wanted many more answers, I was short of time. But in her too-long-didn't-read form, she said that it isn't based on word of mouth. She used to work on the fields that were up in the mountain when she was young. So I stopped her there and asked questions about the mountain's features to simply confirm if I was telling the truth or just talking out of my ass. First, here is what I confirmed. The mountain was steep and dry in the direction of the house, but when you got to the top, it slanted at an angle downward. The slant was covered in brush and small trees and sand that lined lots of yellow and red rock. However, when the land flattened down like a plain, it became a a kind of forest. The trees were not too close together but large, with thick patches of grass and bushes. After this large area, it would go back to a steep angle facing another small city. I confirmed what wildlife was there just to make sure that what I'm going to talk about wasn't anything that she'd ever seen or known to be in the area. I just wanted to know the main things to rule out. This included deer, coyotes, wolves, wild dogs and so on. After, I asked her if my grandma was ever serious about her stories and she confirmed that she indeed was, including the experiences she has had. One was relating to chains being dragged in the dirt behind her several nights in a row, to the point that it caused her to never walk home alone again. Well, in this case, it was just me and 
I wish it hadn't have been. My grandmother always encouraged me to be adventurous, so I decided going up the mountain was the way to go. My mum reluctantly let me go, only after she'd given me at least some basic survival gear and taken my grandma's old yet very powerful dog. But this dog wasn't like ordinary dogs too. It defended its territory viciously and it was essentially a border collie crossed with something that gave it some serious canine power. He was a good guard dog until, as far as I know, he died of natural causes while I was away sometime later. He was only good at guarding, completely failed at any other dog task, and his name was Pippi. But Pippi and I started our adventure early in the morning. It took us until the sun rose above the horizon to slowly make our way up the mountain. My goal was to explore the downward slanted area and do some scouting before attempting the forest ahead. Pippi was more than happy doing his job, keeping a perimeter around me while destroying some flowers every so often. I was flipping for rocks, looking for anything interesting to bring back, but as I flipped a, a flat yellow rock, I noticed something. It was dead silent. There was no wind, no animals. Everything was just still. And as I turned my gaze to see where Pippi was, I heard a loud snap in the direction of the forest. But I just blinked and moved on. Nothing too out of the ordinary, right? And I mean, the dog was happily wagging his tail waiting for our next move, so I started to move around the forest, but something just seemed off. Not in a, a scary way, just in an abnormal way. But the light was not reaching too far into the forest. I know thick canopies can make the illusion of darkness, even on the brightest day, but these trees had a, a decent amount of space between them. I made the conclusion that the angle of the sunlight, combined with the rising temperatures, made the air thick with moisture and was causing this illusion. And I continued to walk, my journey uneventful, or so it seemed. The more I continued to walk, though, the more the dog's eyes began to dart to me as if doubting my decisions to press on. I took it as the dog was simply worried about our distance from home than anything else, but he started to do this again, but now to the forest. He started with the darting eyes, and it got to the point where he was snapping his head in the direction of the forest, back and forth. He continued to do this until, finally, he stopped and didn't take his eyes off the forest. And now... I knew something was up. I assumed this must be the end of my journey as a predator may have been stalking me this whole time. So I signal him to turn around and we began to work our way back. Every few minutes though, he would dart his head in the direction of the forest and it kept me on my toes. This attention to a potential predator was gone when we reached the area that we were at before. As my thoughts began to calm, I felt uh, an enjoyable breeze. How nice to finally cool off, I thought. But this feeling was shattered by the realization that my entire time here, I hadn't heard a single noise but the sound of my dog, myself, and the mysterious snap with no wind up until now. I took one last look at the forest to appreciate its beauty, but I knew better. I took note of the wind's direction. It's not totally unusual to have sudden gusts of wind and breezes from random directions up here. However, this was no ordinary breeze. As I walk to and from different areas and directions, I notice the wind is headed in one direction, the forest. Now, I was more intrigued than anything and I was convinced that the most likely explanation was a dry hot pressure system was above the mountain, forcing cool air to the center where the forest just so happens to be. I asked Pippi if he could still see anything and he responded with a waggy tail and a saggy tongue. So, sure, but why not trust the dog's opinion? I mean, he'd been right so far. We both walked to the edge of the forest and the same darkness was there but... I could make out where the tree seemed to open up again. My only goal at this point was to cross that dark part and face my unrealistic fears. I wasn't an idiot, and if anything had been waiting for me, this dog would charge. I mean, he'd killed coyotes for fun before. And I had also been taught by my uncle at a young age to learn how to fight dogs and large wild cats and whatnot. 
I had locked down dogs with ease and killed a coyote and a wolf in self-defense. Not that I'd ever hurt a dog for no reason at all, but anyway, you get the idea. So, with mine made up, I walked into the forest and there was nothing. No dread and no morbid feeling. The bushes were a bit annoying, but I made it past the darkness and, feeling proud and strong, I inspected what I called a, a taunting forest. I turned to face the direction that I came from and there I saw Pippi at the edge of the forest. He hadn't come with me and I somehow didn't realize it. Still, glad, I smiled at him, but... As I looked closer, a thought raced to my head. The sun should at least be close to 10am. There was no reflection in his eyes, no light, and no forest. As this thought set in, I saw his body language change. And in an instant, he puffed up and showed his teeth. My stomach sank and before I could think anything else... I ran, like a man clinging to the last string of life. As I ran, though, I could have sworn that I saw the darkness follow my every step, all around me. It seemed to be getting darker and darker, too. And just as I felt it overhead, I felt the hard rock on my shoe. In one move, I turned around ready to either live or die, scared shitless and about to piss myself. But there was nothing. Nothing but forest and a calm breeze. The dog let out a soft whimper and I backed away, not letting my eyes off the forest while keeping the dog in my field of view. I turned to look at the edge of the mountain, down the direction of the house, and I saw my mum, who was nervously looking for me with a pair of binoculars. I waved in relief and made my way back down. Visibly shaken, I asked my mum that I needed to talk to my grandma. My mum believed the reason to be that I'd seen a wolf or just some crazy act of nature. I explained everything to my grandma, though, who, oddly, didn't immediately reply with a candid answer. She looked sad as she explained that she didn't have the answer, and the person who might have was my great-grandmother, who had passed away not too long ago, and she had lived up to close to a hundred years. But both our faces fell, and she slowly embraced me, and... I still have questions, and I intend to get answers about that forest, but my recent talk with my family brought up even more stories, and one that we had all heard was that of the cursed or bloody gold that my grandfather was actually a part of and was murdered for, but that's another story for another time. Needless to say, I still don't have answers just yet, but man, that forest, there's something up there. I served in the Marines from age 18 to 28 when I was honorably discharged due to a pinched nerve in my back which led to surgery. Thankfully, surgery worked for me and while I recuperated, I took a job as a driver for an assisted living facility. Technically, I worked for two sister companies which were a 35 to 45 minute drive from one another and I would drive meds, patients, etc. between the two facilities. But usually, I worked the day shift. However, the night shift driver suddenly quit without warning and I was asked why they found someone to cover his shift. One night, I was asked to drive some meds between site A and site B. It was no biggie. I happily hopped into the van and headed to site B. In order to get to site B, I had to drive through a heavily forested area and it was spooky, but as a former marine and someone who grew up in the boondocks, I don't scare very easily. Or so I thought. So, I'm listening to a book on tape as it was an older van with just a CD player. And the radio, it didn't work very well and this was before XM became the new thing. I hear some rustling in the back of the van though. Now, a month prior, a squirrel had somehow made its way inside the van and I thought that maybe it was another one and the sound stopped as I just shrugged it off. I'm driving through the forest, lost in thought when something bites me hard on the back of my neck. I swerve the car almost smashing into another car and my heart's beating a million miles a minute and I immediately pull over. 
I ran out of the car and opened the back and I'm expecting some sort of rabbit squirrel, but sitting there with a blank expression on her face is Agnes, a woman who had severe mental issues and was a resident there. She was muttering that I'm not supposed to be here. She had bit my neck and what was more disturbing was that she had a knitting needle in her hand and she must have taken it from another resident. I ended up calling two of the staff who worked at the ward she lived in and they ended up coming to get her and they talked her down into giving them the needle and managed to get her back to the facility without harm. I had to go and get my bite looked at and I ended up quitting a few months later after another crazy incident. I stayed away from Agnes the rest of my time there and man, am I glad that she used her teeth and not that needle. The year was 1983 and I was four years old, very happy and very trusting, until the fateful day that I was made aware of this strange man. It was Thanksgiving and we made the trip to visit my mother's side of the family. We were at our grandparents' house. At the time, I was an only child and, as a matter of fact, the only child there. I remember being bored after everyone had eaten and asked my dad to take me to a large well-known park in the area. It stood out due to the fact that it had giant animals that were part of the park. A penguin with a slide in its stomach. An elephant that you could climb with help of a ladder. A kangaroo that you could somehow bounce in. And Anyways, you get the point. But my dad jumped at the chance to get out of the house and away from everyone. He was a stranger here and these were in-laws that he never really knew. Cousins, aunts and uncles, great-grandparents, not to mention the friends of these people and all really tight-knit and knowing each other for years. So, we arrived at the park and my first impression when pulling up was the number of kids running around. I noticed the occasional parents as well, keeping a watchful eye on their children. My dad told me that he would watch me from the car and to have fun with the other kids. I jumped out of the back seat and scrambled to the penguin first. I remember bonding with the other kids, and I had of course never met any of them before, but kids seemed to have a, a natural tendency to just flock together, trust one another, and simply play. I was running around like most of the other children, going from slides to the swings, and eventually grew tired and just sat on a bench. It had only been about 15 minutes since I had arrived and was planning on being there for several more hours, and then I noticed him, a man that stood out. I could tell, even as a four-year-old, that he didn't belong here. He was dressed in a trench coat, a hat that matched, and kept looking around, staring at different kids. In my childlike mind, he actually resembled Inspector Gadget, and I knew immediately what he was up to. He was looking for an unattended child, and then he eyed me, my dad being in the car several hundred yards away. And he made the mistaken assumption that I had somehow, as a four-year-old, made it to the park alone. I was then on high alert and I tried to start playing, but all the joy of the day had been sucked out by this creep. I went down a slide, only to see that he skulked over to me like a wraith, watching and waiting. I couldn't bear the tension or the fear anymore, so I ran as fast as possible back to the safety of my father in the car and I jumped into the back seat head down as to keep me hidden from his view. I told my dad that I was ready to go back to my grandmother's house and was relieved as we started pulling away. My curiosity though took over and I peeked my head above the back seat of the car and looked out the back window and he was there looking directly at me and making a come here motion with his finger all the while smiling. I ducked even lower and remained that way until we arrived back at my grandparents home. I have no reason why I failed to tell anyone what happened. Maybe fear that it would somehow bring me closer to him or that I wouldn't be believed. But I didn't tell anyone. I then forgot about this strange man or at least didn't think that I would ever see him again. Flash forward to 1986 and my parents and I move into a low rent apartment. I'm fine at first and everything's normal and... I then noticed one day that our neighbours had moved out and that a new neighbour had moved in. 
and one guess as to who it might be. Everything came back to me in a flash. I freaked out, but for some reason, just kept it all in, not saying a word to anyone. I tried to avoid him and hoped that he wouldn't remember me from the brief moments a few years before. But I was sadly mistaken. As soon as he saw me, I saw a look of recognition on his narrow face. I didn't play alone after that, and as a matter of fact, I didn't go outside really unless my parents were with me. Several months had passed, and of course, I was still on the defense, just waiting for the worst to happen. One day, though, I noticed something odd. He actually had a boy with him, roughly my age, and clearly scared. The child was rarely ever seen, but when seen, the man had a firm grip on him at all times. And my mother, not apparently picking up on the fact that this man was a sick freak, in my mind, the boogeyman told me that I should go next door to his apartment and ask to play with what she thought was his son. No way. Never in a million years did I ever think of doing such an absurd thing and refused without telling her why. I remember seeing the boy a few more times over the course of what had to be weeks and I just always remembered the, the look on his face. The fact that he wanted to tell me something but he was too afraid. It still really haunts me to this day, and even though I was just a child, I'm still filled with guilt for not saying anything. But it was because I was afraid. Afraid for my life, in fact. Afraid of whatever the hell this strange monster of a man wanted to do with me and the boys like me. The last time I saw the boy was in the man's car, and it was an old cream-colored 60s model, and the boy was crying and looked pretty much out of his mind. I stored this memory away and hid it, the darkness of the moment too big for my childlike mind to understand. Eventually, the beast moved away and soon after, we did as well. I was growing up and years had passed and I was a big boy, or so I thought, and a third grade maybe, and my parents had just taken pictures of me playing, being a kid, just regular family stuff. The man was lost in my memories and fading slowly, but of course never really forgotten. The photos were developed by a local grocer and they were picked up and looked over and left on the dash of my parents' car. We then went to the park in my city. It was summer and my parents and I got out of the car and did our tour of the park. The car windows were left down because there was no reason to suspect anything foul happening. I remember that we were at the top of the park and on a large rocky hill and Looking down, wouldn't you know who was there? That same man, dressed in a, a long coat again, but much shabbier, trash-eating, looking quite disheveled and dirty. I remember being afraid, but happy in a strange way, at seeing him so down and out, homeless and hungry. The guy then saunters over to my parents' car and looks in, reaches for something and just makes off. It was the photos of me. My parents yelled and were upset, but as mentioned earlier, we were way above him. The hill we were on turned into a sheer cliff, in fact. The drop was at least 30 feet. You would have to walk completely back around to catch him, and my father tried, but by the time that he got to the car, the guy was just gone. My dad came back to us, and we drove home, and my parents chalked it up to just random chance. They had no memory of this man, and they only saw a mental case, homeless and lost. I processed the whole thing and freaked, knowing that he was still so close, even though years had gone by, and of course, this naturally made me think that he was long gone or dead, or at least not able to magically appear where I was and steal my photos. It's now 1989, and we live in a different house, same city. I'm much bigger, and... Of course, more aware of the world, the positive changes and the negatives. It was summer again and my parents had spent a late night with their longtime friends. It was about one in the morning before we began making our way back home and I was wide awake just staring at the window, eating up the world's visuals with my eyes and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there, there was the stranger again. But once again dressed in the same getup as before. I almost shrieked in the back seat but... 
Instead, remained quiet and hid, praying that he didn't see me. I did notice, though, that he was walking rather quickly, as if he was on a mission to bring fear into the hearts of children everywhere or something. And my parents, they take notice of him and comment on how odd it was that he was dressed in a winter coat and hat in the summertime. But they don't seem to realize that this is the same man that we'd seen seemingly out of nowhere before, countless times. I believe that he didn't see me and I sat up again as we made our way up the street. And then we saw her, a 13 or 14 year old girl crying and running like her life depended on it. She kept looking back, looking for someone or something. I knew what she was looking for and honestly, I was afraid for her. I remember my parents asking her if she needed help or a ride or something but she just flatly refused any help and just kept running. I don't know what she thought that we were up to, but I'm guessing whatever the man had said to her put fear into her heart and she wasn't going to trust anyone or anything at that moment. I never had another incident with this dark version of Inspector Gadget after this and at times wondered what became of him. I sometimes feel the need to research the newspapers, internet and old phone books, anything to discover who he was and what he may have done to the boy I saw and maybe others. I usually begin looking, but I never find anything substantial. Anyway, it still kind of freaks me out to think that there's some weird-ass guy out there who stalked me for years with my childhood photos. A few months ago, a friend of mine introduced me to someone that he knew. We'll call him AJ. AJ is gay and his big claim to fame is that he slept with a well-known UK athlete who is still in the closet. But we had a drink and he talked about that and we really bonded and he seemed like a really cool dude. He also lived near the city of Manchester so I mostly spoke to him online. He would call me a lot and we eventually arranged a night out in Manchester's famous gay village. But for those of you who don't know... The gay village is on Canal Street in Manchester. And yes, on the street sign someone crossed out the sea in Canal. It's literally a row of clubs and pubs on one side and on the other is a canal. If I'm being honest, I hate nights out and I really hate gay clubs. I'm just not the kind of guy who wears his sexuality on his sleeve and to be honest, I've already said the word gay more times than I'm comfortable with so far. But... We went ahead anyway and the first part of the night was alright. AJ took me to all the clubs and they were nice enough and there were decent people just dancing and stuff. Even if they did look at you like you were new fresh meat. There were a few clubs with things going on inside that kind of scared me for entirely different reasons and at one point I was hit on by a guy in his 70s who gave me his business card which was pretty funny I suppose. I used to have really bad anxiety and although I've learned to cope with it and move forward in my life, I still battle it when dealing with new situations. My anxiety is inward focused, meaning that if my heart beats too fast, a, a panicked voice will tell me that it means my heart is about to stop. If my stomach rumbles, it'll tell me that I've got a stomach flu. And for this reason, I was attempting fate and I was being super responsible drinking. I had about three pints of beer and I lost count of how many AJ had. Around midnight, we all walk out of one club. AJ is steaming drunk, uh, stumbling around when a security guard from another club says to him, you're not coming in here. AJ says nothing and then aggressively shoves the guy to one side and storms into the club. And AJ got himself arrested. Great. I'm in a city that I don't know very well. My guide is pissed drunk and arrested and there's no trains home for six hours. Although it's summer, there's a chill in the air too, so I decided I'm going to go into one of the quieter clubs. The quieter is a, a relative term here, that's for sure. And it was still loud as shit. So I go in and I order a beer and I sit at a table which was towards the back and in the dark. I sit alone and just rest there for a while. And then he shows up. A man sits at my table and he looks to be in his late 20s, early 30s. He's got a nice smile and white teeth, short brown hair and clearly well kept. 
Uh, the guy had style, and he engages me in conversation. Uh, just about why a guy like me is alone here, and all that corny, I want to get in bed with you subtext. I viewed it as a game, and every statement that he made, I would try and come up with a, an answer that pushed him away without being rude. So when he said, you got anywhere to be tonight, I replied with, not yet, but I'm waiting for the next train home. And when he said, are you on your own? I replied with, I wasn't, but I am now. He kept buying me drinks, which I just hid under the table when he wasn't looking, and after a while, he seemed to stop coming on to me and instead just wanted to talk. But we found it hard to talk to each other in this place with all the loud music, so we went outside, sneaking our drinks in our pockets. We walked slowly along the canal for about an hour just talking about stuff. I was pretending to be a bit more drunk than I was because I wanted him to think that he hadn't wasted his money buying me drinks. He seemed genuinely interested in my life and my stresses at the time too, so I just wanted to be nice. I had been through a messy breakup and after a while, I was just venting to the guy and he smiled and listened to everything I had to say. After a while, he sat on the wall with his feet dangling over the canal and I sat next to him. The sky had started to glow dark blue, meaning that it would soon be light and I was starting to think about getting a move onto the train station when I noticed that he was looking at me. I looked back and he said my name and said, this is really important. He seemed like he was trying to find the right way to phrase something and then he said, have you ever thought about ending your life? You don't have to tell me because I know it's personal. I replied honestly and said, no, things would have to get really bad in my life before I would want to end it like that. He grimaced at me and looked back at his feet. I looked back at the sky and I was just about to say something when something pushed my back and I fell from the wall right into the canal. I think my brain did a hard reset because when I went into the water, everything just went out of my mind. It was ice cold. I remember my mind just switching back on and I tried to take a breath but I was underwater. I freaked out and flailed my arms and legs and it took a lot of effort to move them because all my limbs felt like they were made of stone. I surfaced and the guy was stood on the fence and he leaned down and lent out his hand to me and I swam towards him and took it, struggling to breathe. I grabbed his hand and he lifted me about halfway back up before he pushed me back in, even further this time. At this point, my mind clicked that it was him who pushed me in the first time, so I swam instead to the other side of the canal, grabbed the wall which was too steep for me to climb out and I shouted for help as loud as I could. I saw him look at me and then just take off running away. I heard voices nearby and someone screamed seeing me in the canal. I was shaking and feeling faint and I don't remember a lot about what happened next but I remember grabbing a rope and putting in a lot of energy to climb up. I remember someone in an apron wrapping me in a blanket and I remember the ambulance people talking to me and asking me in the most patronizing way how much of you had to drink. I woke up in a hospital bed feeling terrified. I mean, that guy had tried to kill me. The look in his eyes when he reached out his hand to me, he wasn't smiling or showing any emotion. His face was blank as he pushed me back into the water. I told the doctors that I wanted to talk to the police and I gave a full statement to the officers and they took my details and said that they would check the CCTV. I felt like the stupidest idiot ever when they asked me for his name and I realized that he'd never given me one. It made me realize that the whole night, he barely said a word about himself in fact. He just asked questions and commented on things about my life. About mid-morning, AJ, freshly bailed, came and picked me up from the hospital and took me back to his and I told him everything and he said, I think you've had a really lucky escape. The reason why is because this guy that I met apparently matched the profile of a potential serial killer dubbed the pusher. Since 2008, there have been 80 bodies found floating in the canals in Manchester, most of whom are found near the gay village and most of whom are young males like me. The police kept releasing statements saying that there's no evidence that it's a serial killer, but how much evidence is there going to be when the guy just walks up and fucking pushes you into a canal? I mean, the water is so cold that most people just go into shock and die, especially if they're drunk. 
this has to be the same guy who pushed me in and it really terrifies me. I'm honestly so scared to think that I'm a serial killer's one guy that got away. I don't even live near Manchester and I'm totally scared about this. I keep thinking that I can feel someone's hand on my back when I'm sleeping. I don't know who he is or why he did this or anything. And so, back to my warning. I know that the gay culture has a, a tendency towards silence and it's getting better these days, but a few of my friends have been sexually assaulted and they don't go to the police because they think that the gay factor will somehow count against them. But I'm asking you all, anyone who visits Canal Street in Manchester, please have a good time, but do not take drinks from strangers. Do not go for walks with strangers and make sure to stay the hell away from that canal. If you see anything or know anything, please contact the police too. And the more information and pressure that they have on them, the more likely they are to put people on the street to actually look for this freak. And please, be safe out there. There's monsters on the street. <laughs>